Years back, a psychologist who was studying infant behavior noted that infants tend to be happiest when they've learned that they can do something about their environment and they can predict the results of what they've done. It can be something very simple, like making a noise or moving something around. This is one of the reasons why when an infant learns how to make a noise, it will repeat it over and over and over again. It's not only that you can have an influence on them, your environment, but you can anticipate what that influence is going to do. And as we get older, of course, we get more discerning in what kind of influence we want to have. And we figure out more and more complex things. But there's a joy in all of that. It's basically, when you think about the different ways the Buddha talks about self, sometimes self is the consumer, self is the producer, and self is the commentator. It's where they all come together. The producer does something, the commentator sees it. You can predict the results, figures it out, and it's pleasant. It's joy. As we get more and more discerning in what we accept as making something that produces joy, that's how we grow up. And when we meditate, we're simply carrying that process further on. This is why it's important to realize that we are responsible for doing what we're doing here as we meditate, and we're trying to figure things out. It's not the case that we give up on our agency. We actually continue to find joy in agency, but we find more and more mature forms of joy, figuring out our own mind. This is one of the reasons why meditation can be so frustrating, though, because the mind is very complex. You follow the instructions one day, and they seem to work. The mind settles down. Then you do what you think is exactly the same thing the next day, and your mind is all over the place. Which means that there's a lot to figure out. And the first steps are basically just trying to figure out how to get the mind to settle down. How can we get it quiet? How can we get it to stay with one thing? And the commentator has to do some direct -to thought and evaluation to figure things out. If things, the mind is not settling down, why? Is it the breath? Is it the mind? Is it something you've carried in from earlier in the day? A mood? A memory of an incident that irked you? How can you think your way past that? If it's a problem that the mind is carrying in, you've got to do some mental, mental work. Remind yourself that why it's there's no reason to bring those moods in. Just because the mood happened in the course of the day doesn't mean you need it to continue. Here you can bring in the breath. Breathe in a way that breathes through whatever tension there may be in the body that's related to that incident, that related to that mood. Try to get as interested as you can in the breath. Try to figure things out. When you breathe in, where does the breath energy feel like it's coming in? Does it feel like it's coming in? Does it feel like it's radiating out from the body? Look for that. And this is one of the reasons why the Buddha lists direct thought and evaluation as one of the first necessary steps in getting the mind to settle down. It's the insight part of your concentration practice, as you begin to realize that how you put things together right now depends both on the raw materials you have to work with coming in from your past karma. And past karma here can be anything from earlier in this lifetime or habits you picked up from previous lifetimes all the way up to things that happened just a few minutes ago. And then your skill in dealing with the different problems that your past karma can throw up. It's one of the reasons why I have to keep practicing again and again and again. Because our past karma is a mixed bag. Different karmic seeds ripen at different rates. There may be something waiting for tomorrow it's still in your mind. It's not showing itself yet. 
which is one of the reasons why doing the same thing today and doing the same thing tomorrow will not necessarily get the same results. It's like the difference between fixing a salad with store-bought tomatoes as opposed to tomatoes you've grown for yourself. The raw materials are different, and you have to be able to sense that and learn how to deal with it. Which means that you're a commentator, one that's trying to figure things out and decide what needs to be done. Needs the energy to figure things out. This, of course, sometimes runs into a problem. You, you need the energy to figure things out, but you can't access that energy because the mind is tired. It's a problem in the abstract, but you find that things settle down. And the concentration and the figuring out can help each other along. When you figure out how you can do that, then there's a lot more joy in this, the agency of getting the mind to settle down. And of course, there's the problem once it's settled down, there's a part of the mind that's going to complain that it's bored. And our normal reaction is to look for something else, think about something else. In meditation circles, this is where Vipassana romances happen. You start fantasizing about other people around you. Or you can fantasize about all kinds of things. You have to realize that the boredom is the problem. You've got to understand this is something you've got to figure out. And again, remember that joy doesn't come just from having a pleasant breath experience, because if it did, you could sit here breathing comfortably and there would be no problem at all. But the mind likes to figure things out. And if it's very still and nothing seems to be happening, it's going to look for something. I'll try to figure out that attitude of boredom. What is the mind telling itself? And who is telling whom in here? There's a lot going on in the present moment, even when the mind is still. And it's your ability to realize that, look into it, understand it. Because that's one of the ways in which the concentration gets deeper. You begin to realize that the direct thought and evaluation are no longer necessary. Then you've got to figure out how do we just stay with the sensation of the breath. So the sense of the breath and your awareness and the body all seem to become one. And then when you've got that, how do you maintain it? That's one thing you can try to figure out. The other, of course, is figure out your distractions. Why does the mind like to go for boredom? We don't think of it as a choice. It seems to be a fact, but it's a decision you make. And the way to counteract that decision is to remind yourself there are a lot of subtle things going on. And if you really want to see them, you've got to get the mind really, really quiet and on top of things. And learn how to ask questions about this conversation in the Committee of the Mind. Because you find that it's not just one commentator in there, not just one producer or one consumer. There are lots of them. You're training the one who tries to master the, the issue of concentration, master the issue of the meditation, tries to get past your defilements. There are other commentators as well. They have other agendas. And you have to learn how to tame them, get them on your side. Because all the commentators are trying to figure out how to predict what's going to give rise to happiness. And so if you keep reminding them, well, the genuine article is something that's going to have to be found inside and not through your fantasies. It's found by watching the processes of the mind as they happen right here, right now. 
It's like the difference between watching a play from out in the audience and then watching the production from backstage, seeing all the lighting technicians and all the actors as they get ready to go on stage. Instead of being in the thought or being in the world of what's ha supposedly happening in the play, you're looking at the mechanics. And it's the mechanics of the mind that are really interesting. Here you are shaping your experience, and you're trying to do it in such a way that gives rise to happiness. And yet so often the happiness turns to something else. You think something will give good results, and it doesn't. Or you thought that certain results were okay, acceptable, but you realize that if you keep putting up with that, that level of what's acceptable, you're going to keep on suffering. So you have, to, you have to raise the standards for all three functions. The commentator, the consumer, the producer. By watching them in practice, figuring them out. So there's really no reason to be bored as you're here. There's a lot going on. Just as we've taught ourselves to, to ignore it. So we can carry on with other, whatever other conversations we'd like to get interested in. So you realize there's a lot to see here. There's a lot to figure out, and you really do want to try to figure it out. I don't understand those instructions you hear sometimes. They say, don't try to figure anything out, just sort of be with whatever. There's no joy in that. There's no joy in just accepting whatever. The Buddha wasn't the sort of person who didn't try to figure things out. Look at all the teachings he has, analyzing the different ways the mind can settle down, analyzing the different ways the mind can create problems. All those lists of qualities. That wasn't the product of a mind that didn't want to figure things out. And to figure things out, he didn't just say, well, just accept whatever I've given you. You've got to figure them out, too, because you're not here just to figure out the lists in the, in the books, figure out the words. You've got to figure out your own mind, because the mind is the problem that's getting in the way of true happiness, even though it wants true happiness. But it can master the skills that lead there. That's an important problem to figure out, and it's an important thing that you learn how to take joy in the process of figuring things out. There's a word in Thai, Sung Sai, it means both to doubt and to wonder. And in some cases, that the doubt is. A hindrance. If you doubt that you can do this, you doubt that it's worth it. But if you start wondering, what's going on? Why can I not find the happiness I really want? That's the doubt of curiosity. And there's a joy in figuring things out. And the curiosity is what motivates that. So learn to be curious about your own mind. If you're not curious about your own mind, what can you be curious about? There's a lot to be figured out here, and there's a lot of joy in the process of figuring things out, and even greater joy when you figure out what the mind is doing that's getting in the way of the deathless, the happiness that really does satisfy. To that little infant in all of us, the one that finds joy in figuring things out. Grows up into a mature meditator, and not by abandoning that joy in figuring things out, but learning how to pursue it skillfully.